we all take precautions when on holiday. From travel insurance, all the way through to packing an extra pair of socks, it's good to be prepared for those unexpected moments. But what would you do if your four-year-old daughter disappeared? My name is Adrian, and welcome back to another video by Coffeehouse Crime, and a happy festive season to all of you. So there is no flannel today, instead it's Christmas jumpers to reflect the holiday spirit. And with Christmas this week, this case is slightly different to my usual, which will become more evident towards the end of this video. Today we're looking at the harrowing disappearance of Cleo Smith, who was abruptly snatched from her parents while on a camping trip in Western Australia. And just a quick reminder, but I post solved, unsolved, and strange cases here on a weekly basis, so if that sounds like a kind of thing, please consider subscribing to Coffeehouse Crime. So, who exactly is Cleo Smith? And what were the series of events that unfolded after her disappearance? Pull up a seat, grab a coffee, and sit back. This is the case of Cleo Smith. Today, we're going back to the land down under, also known as Australia, and more specifically, to the state of Western Australia. In fact, we're going as far west as the continent will allow, to the remote coastal town of Carnarvon. And when I say remote, I mean it. The closest city to Carnarvon is Perth, which is located over 550 miles away. And with a population of around 4,500 residents, the town isn't very large either, but it does have a sizeable tourist industry. Located just north of the Shark Bay World Heritage Site, and found just south of the Ningaloo Reef, it's a destination that attracts those looking to experience the marine wildlife that Western Australia has to offer. Carnarvon is in one of the hottest areas in Australia too, with record highs of 118 degrees Fahrenheit or 48 degrees Celsius, making this arid landscape both beautiful and dangerous. Carnarvon itself is a bustling modern town, home to many growing families and communities, and one of these families was the Smiths. The family of four includes mother Ellie Smith, stepfather Jake Glidden, and their two girls, four-year-old Cleo Smith and Isla Mae Glidden, who was the newest addition to the family at just seven months old. Cleo Smith was born to her mother Ellie and her biological father Daniel Staines, and sadly, their relationship didn't last long, the two deciding to split shortly after Cleo was born. But shortly after this, Ellie would meet Jake Glidden, a fun-loving outdoorsman who loved to be in the ocean more than most folk. Jake often spent most of his free time fishing and diving around the ports and bays of Western Australia, aiming for the big ones, from giant trevelli to tiger sharks. The two eventually fell in love, both of them bouncing off of each other's positive energy, and after two happy years together, Cleo received news that she was going to have a little sister, Isla Mae Glidden being welcomed to the Smith Glidden family on the 3rd of March 2021. The family were ecstatic for her birth, and they all lived happily together in their home in Carnarvon. And after several months of successful baby rearing, the family thought it was a great idea to have some time away. Somewhere close by, but somewhere far enough to feel like a holiday. Casting their minds back to their own childhoods, Ellie and Jake reminisced of a place called Blowholes, a campsite along the coast of Western Australia, roughly 50 miles north of Carnarvon. They planned to re-explore what the coastline had to offer. Jake wanting to share his love of fishing with his daughters, and Ellie wishing to let Ella splash around in the ocean for her first time. And so, the family packed their car full of all the supplies that they needed. Tents, sleeping bags, beds, and a gazebo. They then set off on the Friday of the 15th of October 2021, for their first ever camping trip as a new family of four. After arriving, the family set up their tent which was pretty large, and compromised of two bedrooms and a makeshift living area. Ellie and Jake would sleep in one bedroom, while Cleo and Ella slept in the other, the two bedrooms only separated by a thin divider of tarp. After setting the tent up and having dinner, it was around 8pm when Cleo started to get tired and rather irritated, and so the young couple decided to put their two daughters to bed for the night. Ellie took Cleo to her bedroom, got her changed into her pink onesie, and then tucked her into her bed for the night. It was particularly stormy this evening, and the coastal wind was blowing quite aggressively. After setting her down, Ellie returned outside to the gazebo to spend some time under the stars with Jake. Being a young parent was tough, and the two deserved this break. 
It wasn't until around 1.20 in the morning that Ellie could hear Cleo stirring in her bed. She wanted a glass of water, and so after being given a drink, she was ushered back to sleep. But after that, the rest of the night peacefully rolled with time, the family of four sleeping through the coastal darkness. There is nothing more sure than a morning that follows an evening, but this one held a very troubling surprise. It was around 6am when Ellie and Jake woke to the sound of Ela crying, which wasn't unusual, she was a baby after all, and this was the regular time which she complained for feeding. Ellie was first to get out of bed, and as she began to fix up Ela's morning bottle, she realised something was amiss. The tent zipper to her children's bedroom was open, and it wasn't just open to the point where a child could reach out. It was open almost the entire way. A feeling of dread consumed Ellie's body. She rushed over to the compartment to check on her children, and as she pushed the divider aside to look in, dread unmasked itself into terror. The bedroom was half empty. Both Cleo and the sleeping bag that she had slept in had vanished. Alarm bells in Ellie's head immediately began to ring. She screamed out to Jake to let him know that Cleo was missing, and so began their worst nightmare. Rushing out of the tent, Ellie started searching for Cleo, calling her name and looking anywhere she may have gone. But deep down, Ellie knew this was to no avail. Cleo wasn't the type to go wandering off, especially in the dead of night. The commotion had concerned neighbouring campers, and within several minutes, the entire campsite was out looking for Cleo. Visiting this campsite many times in their childhoods, both Ellie and Jake knew this campsite very well, so they were able to look in all the nooks and crannies that Cleo may be. But even with this insider knowledge, Cleo was nowhere to be found. She was definitely off the campsite. Ellie called the police, and at 6.23 in the morning of the 16th of October, a call to 000 was made to report the four-year-old Cleo Smith as missing. And just seven minutes later, the first police vehicle was dispatched to the campsite, followed by another just two minutes later. Police were taking this incident very seriously, and upon arrival, they taped off the family's camping spot to avoid any interference with evidence, while they began to scour the surrounding areas for clues. From the beaches, to the dunes, to the plains around the park. By 8am, police were already on site at the family's home back in Carnarvon, and police helicopters were spotted in the surrounding areas, looking for any signs of Cleo. Investigation teams were quick to rule out that Cleo had left the tent that night by herself, as there was no way she could have opened her own bedroom considering how far the zip was opened, let alone to make sure that she left no traces while leaving. As the search for Cleo Smith turned from hours into days, Ellie and Jake were becoming more frantic and desperate. They needed some additional help, and thankfully, the public's interest in Cleo's case was growing. On Sunday the 17th of October, Ellie and Jake conducted their first publicly broadcasted interview. It's the case that's baffling Australia, and tonight, little Cleo Smith's parents are making an emotional plea to find their daughter. The four-year-old vanished from an outback campsite in Western Australia four days ago, and now the search is nationwide as her family fears she was abducted. She would be terrified, she would be so scared. The tent was completely um, open, it was about 30 centimetres from being open and I mean, I turned around to Jake and and I just said like, Claire's gone. Beautiful, um, delicate, she um, has like the biggest heart, she um, just so funny and really all we need is a little girl home. If there wasn't enough interest already, this interview is what really ignited the media's attention over Cleo. Police followed this up by releasing images of the onesie Cleo had been wearing that night, and also of the sleeping bag that was taken with her, in hope that it would generate some leads. The first 72 hours of any missing person's case is crucial, and especially when it comes to missing children. Statistically speaking, over 90% of children who are reported missing are found in the first 48 hours, but after this time frame, the outcome and likelihood becomes more and more dire. And sadly, this window of opportunity for Cleo slowly crept by with nothing to show for it. 
By the following Thursday, the leader of the Australian Labour Party announced a $1 million reward for any information that may help find Clio. We're going to offer a $1 million reward uh, to anyone who provides information that leads to us finding Clio. So uh, the, re the police are very keen to offer this reward to hopefully allow for us to uh, discover the, locations of, the location of Clio uh, as soon as possible. And uh, I just urge anyone who has any knowledge of the location of Clio, please uh, provide that information to police. Her image spread across the country like wildfire from billboards in Perth, to shop windows, TV networks, and of course missing persons poster campaigns. And through the hundreds of tips and phone calls, this would help build more information for the police to go on. Several days had passed by now, and they desperately needed more leads. Detectives were gathering intel and any information that they could find, ranging from dashcam footage, all the way through to local garbage collections surrounding the campsite and the family's home in Carnarvon. On Sunday the 24th of October, nine days after four-year-old Cleo went missing, the investigation would receive some critical information. Two witnesses had finally came forward. They declared that, at around 3am on the night that Cleo went missing, they had noticed a sedan come out of the blowholes campsite and turn right towards Carnarvon. This new information gave investigating officers a new momentum into finding Cleo. Cleo's disappearance was now countrywide news, and over 200 possible sightings of Cleo had been reported. Every single one of them was followed up, but at this stage, they all proved to be dead ends. To add to the unbearable experience for the family, online armchair detectives started to create allegations against Ellie and Jake, insinuating that they had some form of involvement in Cleo's disappearance. And these allegations, which were made by nothing but overly opinionated individuals, did nothing but stir up media and those close to Clio. In fact, the online attacks became so bad, Premier McGowan had to plead with online trolls to lay off Clio's parents, with Superintendent Wilde making the following statement. We want to make it clear. They are not suspects in this investigation. They have been helping us. With the investigation now building maturity, and the ever-increasing volume of surveillance footage, forensic evidence, witness statements, and garbage collection, things were now slowly coming together to form an impression of what may have happened to Cleo. With police deducting, it was more than likely that Cleo was still in Western Australia. They started zeroing in on the family's hometown of Carnarvon. With the identification of the kidnapper's car, investigators began to scour surveillance footage. Narrowing down this area of interest was of peak importance to investigators. Yet, it didn't seem likely to happen unless new information came their way. When would their next clue slide into place? Will they ever be able to find Cleo? Was she even alive? Or had something terrible happened to her? November the 2nd. 18 days have passed since Cleo was last tucked into bed by her mother, who was now panicking for her child's safety, and in desperate hope that she will one day be reunited with her daughter. All in the meanwhile, police were working overtime in following a forensic trail of clues to find the whereabouts of Cleo. Witness reports of the car that left blowholes at 3am had evolved into the identification and tracking of a specific vehicle. And when combined with surveillance and dashcam footage, investigators were making progress. The effort of searching through countless bags of rubbish and collecting forensic evidence from the tent were very much proving their value, as it had helped build a partial DNA profile of the suspect. And all of these clues, along with hard forensic evidence, would eventually shine the spotlight over a specific individual. And this individual's name was Terence Kelly. Terence Kelly is a rather peculiar man. Aged 36 years old, he coincidentally lived only two miles away from Cleo's family home, residing on Tonkin Crescent in Carnarvon, just a seven minute drive between the two houses. Described by neighbours as a quiet person and a loner, Terence lived by himself, along with his dog. But little did they know, behind closed doors, he had a rather unusual hobby for a man his age. You see, Terence liked to collect dolls, and by dolls, I mean a lot of dolls. Lots and lots of dolls. His personal favourites being Bratz, a style of American fashion doll. 
and his house was absolutely covered in them, from wall to wall. In fact, he enjoyed these dolls so much that he devoted an entire Facebook profile to display his love for them, posting many images of him posing with his dolls and his wider collection. Terence often took these dolls out in public with him, taking pictures and giving them regular care by doing their hair and dressing them up. And very disturbingly, he treated these dolls as if they were living and breathing. Terence's strange antics on Facebook doesn't stop there. It gets much worse. Take a glance at Facebook and you would assume that Terence had several daughters. There's Chiara De Luca, Anaya, Natalia, Tenille, and Katie. Which I'm sure confused investigators to begin with, because Terence has no daughters. They're all fake accounts. Terence had actually created a whole family online for himself, consisting of a wife and many daughters. And his so-called family would interact with him on Facebook, including some posts that would seem inappropriate for a family relationship. All of these accounts were run by Terence. He was in fact talking to himself, and role-playing a whole family of conventionally attractive women. Adding this strange demeanour to the data and evidence that police had on Terence made Terence a prime suspect for Cleo's disappearance, and police wanted to act fast. With Cleo's disappearance soon reaching three weeks, Ellie, Jake and Daniel were all desperate and terrified for her safety, and statistically speaking it didn't look very good for her either. With it being this long, the odds in finding Cleo still alive were not in their favour, and this was dwindling with each and every day that passed by. Cleo was only four years old at the time. It's an understatement to say that she hadn't really even began her life yet, and the thought of it ending so soon was unbearable for family and friends to think about. As the impatience settled in, nerves heightened. There were feelings of sadness, dread, anger and frustration. But above all, hope. And that is when, at 1am on Wednesday the 3rd of November, police raided Terence Kelly's home on Tonkin Crescent, not even 24 hours after learning of his existence. The police had no idea what they would find inside. They prepared themselves in the fact that it may be nothing, or possibly, it could be a worst case scenario. On arrival, officers found the house to be locked, and with no immediate answer at the door, they opted to use a battering ram to break in. They searched room by room, finding each one empty, and as they approached the last bedroom of the house, they tentatively opened the door. We got her. We got her. Hey, Bobby. Let's bring Hello. the camera in. Hey, Bobby. Come here. Come here. I've got you, Bobby. What's your name? You're all right. What's your name? What's your name, sweetheart? Your name is Cleo. Hello, Cleo. Cleo Smith was discovered by police officers, safe and physically well, sitting in her pyjamas, with her hair brushed while playing with toys. And Terence was nowhere to be found in the house. Officers picked up Cleo and removed her from his home before investigating the house as a crime scene. And just one hour later, Terence was pulled over in his car and arrested on suspicion of kidnapping thus bringing the disappearance of Cleo Smith to an end. Cleo Smith was alive and well, but for Terence, it was a very different story. He was in a world of shit, and this was only the beginning for him. The very next morning, neighbours who lived around Terence came forward to suggest that he very well could have been housing Cleo for those 18 days. His dog was confirmed to have been left outside for that entire period, which apparently was unusual for Terence. And every time Terence left the house, he would speed away as if he were in a rush. Terence was also spotted buying nappies from the local Woolworth supermarket, something that the locals had found strange, as he had never done this before. It was all coming together for those around him. The quiet loner that lived on Tonkin Crescent had been hiding a very dark secret. And I'm talking about Cleo, not the dolls. We thought it might be that little girl now, which it was, yeah. So then I went closer to the detective's car, yeah, and I saw her in the back of the car, yeah, with the detective, he was holding her, yeah. And when you saw her in the back of the car, what was going through your mind? I was like, a bit shocked too at the same time, yeah, because our neighbours, like, they quiet and that, they like, they do their own thing, but everyone, like, they know 
the person who stays at that house that I wouldn't think about or wouldn't thought about it would be him or something new. Terence was taken into custody and his house was examined by forensic teams, many items being taken from his property. Police were seen taking bags upon bags of evidence and even items as large as a rolled up rug. He was also officially charged with multiple offences, including forcibly abducting a child under the age of 16. And while being held at a police station in Carnarvon, he was also beaten by a fellow detainee as soon as they had learned who he was. Since his arrest, Terence has been moved into a maximum security prison in Perth. He is now awaiting trial, and is currently confined in a solitary, safe cell. But to the more important details, after 18 excruciating days away from family and home, Cleo was reunited with her parents and her friends, who were all ecstatic to have her back, and safe and well. Her safe return created widespread joy and relief across all of Australia, with Police Commissioner Chris Dawson breaking down and crying upon hearing the news. The conclusion to this case could have been very different, but with thanks to everyone who provided clues, and the investigating officers who never gave up, this story does indeed come with a happy ending. I mean, did you really expect anything else over a Christmas episode? I for one wish Cleo and her family a very speedy recovery. I'm sure that there will be obstacles along the way, but the overall conclusion to this case is very positive. With primary school beginning at the age of five, Cleo is set to take her first steps into education next year. She is once again at the very beginning of a lifetime of happy memories. All the best, Cleo. Thank you again for watching another video today by Coffeehouse Crime, and a Merry Christmas to all of you, and a Merry Christmas from Nero too. We have one more video coming out before the end of this year, so I'll see you again next week. But until then, be safe wherever you are, travel safe if you're going anywhere, and above all, look after each other. I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.